So in the previous part, I introduced the diffraction pattern as we expect from a neutron. And the specific diffraction patterns are uh, caused uh, is caused by uh, coherent scattering length that I explained. But I thought that since uh, neutron and X-ray diffractions, especially X-ray diffraction is the most uh, commonly used technique. It's important that I provide a comparison of the two to the students so that uh, the subject becomes clearer. I'm talking about neutron and X-ray diffraction on the same footing. And I'll show you that they are almost same except for a few differences like uh, coherent and incoherent scattering length part. So at the onset, I must mention clearly that in any diffraction experiment, we are not taking photographs. So I just showed you uh, atoms in, a, in an FCC crystal. That's how they're arranged. But to get that, what I do is uh, do a diffraction experiment as a function of angle, or we can write it as a function of the wave vector transfer Q, which is K minus K prime given by 4 pi by lambda sine theta when there is no energy transfer. And we are working in Fourier space. And all your diffraction experiments, you can see on the right bottom, I show a typical diffraction pattern of some samples at various temperatures. So you get this kind of patterns, which are actually caused by the diffraction. And the diffraction peaks signify various arrangement, crystallographic arrangement, like one I shown as a photograph. So we are working in the Q space, known as scattering law. So SQ. I'm working in SQ space, and the information I am getting is the real part, real space distribution, and their Fourier transform of each other. And in these experiments, our task is to rebuild N of R in a way. So N of R is the starting point. And with this, I'll go to a master's degree. But before that, I just quickly give a comparison of the properties between X-rays and neutrons, which I repeatedly said that uh, their wavelengths are typically 1.54 angstrom, you know, for X-rays, for copper K alpha. Neutrons also have same, but in a tabletop experiment, this 1.54 angstrom comes from a copper target. So it's some characteristic wavelength of a specific target. Molybdenum, if you use, it will be even lower, 0.6 or 0.7 angstrom. In case of neutron, I have a continuous Maxwellian distribution and we select the wavelength, which are typically in this range. Interaction of X-rays. This is something one needs to digest. It depends on the electron density in that, rather electron density distribution. So this is not the free electron. It's the bound electron density distribution and caused by Thomson scattering. In case of neutron, it is neutron nuclear interaction. And later I will bring in also with the atomic magnetic moment. So far I have not discussed it. It will be introduced a little later. Because X-ray is an electromagnetic wave, it strongly attenuates in a medium. In, uh, and actually we get information typically from few microns to tens of microns. Neutrons can penetrate very deeply, even tens of centimeters. It can go in because it's a chargeless particle. Another important difference is that in case of X-ray, the scattering length increases monotonically with Z. We know it follows Moseley's law and it increases monotonically with Z. Whereas neutron nuclear interaction, I, at some point I mentioned that it is fluctuating across the Z values in a periodic table and uh, it provides good contrast between isotopes many times. And uh, I am sorry, you mentioned some point that some point that uh, uh, the express it follows a linear increase, I'm sorry, it is Moseley's law is a power law. So in case of X-rays, the scattering intensity or scattering length varies 
z minus mu to the power q for x rays. So primarily what I am trying to evaluate is this. I have got an incident wave function e to the power i k r and uh, I have an outgoing wave function which is e to the power i k prime r and this k to k prime change in direction is caused by the crystal scattering potential. So if we go back to our kittel or any one of the master's degree books, basically the scattering amplitude A is given as a Fourier transform of the electron density in this case over the entire crystal which I have written down as an integration over is a Fourier transform of the density I can write d3r which is 3 hour dv which I wrote there this is how I expressed my scattering amplitude a you can see that this is very similar to what I obtained from the Fermi golden rule in case of neutrons. I will go ahead and I will show you the same way. The expression for scattering, this is a scattering amplitude and nr depends on electron density. So this nr is the electron density in case of uh, any condensed matter. By electron density I mean there are atoms at sites with electron clouds which causes Thomson scattering of the X-rays for diffraction. And in case of neutrons it will be coherent scattering length density. So when I write that it is a Fourier transform over the entire crystal, the crystal consists of lattice. So it's a combination of unit cells, combination of unit cells. This is one, one unit cell where I have just drawn a square lattice. I can easily extend it to three dimensions. So this depends on the unit cells. Now this integration I can represent it as sum over unit cells, cells and the integration over a single unit cell of it's a three dimension so i integrate over one unit cell one unit cell and then sum over all the unit cells then i get the scattering amplitude because the crystal is built with the repetition of the unit cells So now, uh, this is what the expression is, sum over unit cells, I wrote d3 are there, dv are the same, volume integral, n of r equal. Now, for X-ray scattering, we have been taught that all values of the reciprocal lattice vector are not allowed. You have specific peaks in the Bragg pattern, Bragg scattering. And actually when Q is equal to G, then the Bragg scattering occurs. So we don't have all values of reciprocal lattice vectors, but when Q is equal to G, a reciprocal lattice vector, then we get Bragg scattering. That's uh, what the world construction tells us. And if I consider one of the lattice sites, one of the lattice sites one of the lattice sites then there is electron charge cloud around it so if this is the jth lattice site so the uh, the unit cell consists of these lattice sites where i have the electron charge cloud and in this case then I can write n of r 
equal to so this is rj let us say i have some arbitrary origin so this is rj and any arbitrary point is r so i am the density of cloud, charge cloud is given by r minus rj and summed over all the points in the lattice and that gives me one unit cell then i sum up over all the unit cells so this is the expression for the density so now I can write the scattering amplitude is integration over unit cell, sum over all the unit cells, sum over all the unit cells, then density which I wrote n is actually r minus rj and then e to the power minus g dot r because whenever reciprocal amplitude q is equal to, I mean sorry, the wave vector transfer q is equal to a reciprocal vector uh, in the reciprocal lattice vector then uh, then and then only Bragg scattering takes place i understand i that you are familiar of reciprocal lattice of a crystal lattice this is given by the expressions In case of cubic lattice, if A is the real lattice, then reciprocal lattice will be twice pi by A. But in general, the reciprocal lattice A A A is given by B cross C every day A dot B cross C. This is the definition of reciprocal lattice. So basically, because it depends inversely, if in one direction it is A, in the that direction it will contract to 1 by A. And so if I have a real lattice which is like this, two dimension, the reciprocal lattice will have a dimension which is slightly like this. So the reciprocal lattice, and let me get back to my point that uh, Whenever Q is equal to G, I have a reciprocal lattice vector equal to reciprocal lattice vector Q, then I will have Bragg scattering. And I have to add up over the all the charge clouds which are centered around J point. I have to, for the unit cell, I have to sum over all the J or all the lattice points, and the general wave vector in a charge cloud is given by Nj of R minus Rj. So now in a simple way, I write R minus Rj, I define another vector rho, then R equal to rho plus Rj and in that integration D3R n of r minus rj so instead of r i put rho plus rj r minus rj becomes rho and then the variable becomes d3 rho so then i have integration over a single charge cloud summation over j
So now you can see that here my integration breaks up into a summation over all the lattice points and integration over a single charge cloud. So what I am left with actually, I can show you, I am left with an integration over a single charge cloud which gives me, if it is a J charge cloud, then it is Fj, which is Nj rho, it is over as Ig dot rho, and there is a summation over all these charge clouds in a single crystal, single in itself. So what I mean is that, let me take one unit cell. Let me take one unit cell. So I have these charge clouds. I have these charge clouds around each point. So that integration over one unit cell, unit cell goes to, goes to integration over a charge cloud, a single charge cloud and summation over all the charge clouds. So I will write this actually now, that previous expression. So summation over all the charge clouds f of j where the f of j f of j is equal to I will not use Q anymore. It's a tri triple integral, triple integral. So this integral is basically, if you see there's a charge cloud, around an atom, this is Nj rho and this is a Fourier transform over the charge cloud. This is known as form factor. Many of you are familiar with this term form factor. And now what we have for the scattering amplitude is this form factor multiplied by a to the power minus Ig dot Rj. Let me just take a typical example. So now you see here in real space, any point Rj is given by Axj plus Byj plus Cjj in terms of ABC. And in the reciprocal space, it is the HKL, the Bragg coefficients is given by HA plus AB plus LC. So, one is the Fourier transform over the charge cloud around one point, which is Fj, and the other is G dot Rj, which is here, G dot Rj equal to Axj plus Byj plus Czj dot Ha plus Av plus Lc, which gives me twice pi Xjh, because A dot A is one, b dot b is 1, a dot b is 0, so you just get a x j x j h y j k and z j l. So now I have the form factor f j and I have it to the power minus i g dot r j. So in real lattice, real lattice it is given by Axj plus Byj plus Czj, which are the real lattice vectors, and the reciprocal lattice vector G is given. No, I will write there. A is equal to.
which is a real lattice points and the reciprocal lattice point is given by a h or h a the way normally it is written h a h k l plane is k b plus l c l c in the reciprocal space and g dot r j for a crystalline lattice is basically dot product of these two a dot a is one b dot b is one c dot c is one because they are reciprocal of each other size wise it's especially in a cubic lattice this c is nothing but one by c this b is nothing but one by b and this a is nothing but one by a they're one but, but otherwise in general also this is true so it is nothing but x j h plus y j l plus z j k h k l so if i talk about an h k l point then g dot r j for that point is given by x j h y j l plus z j k for the real lattice now it is interesting this gives me the selection rules but before that what is fj let me discuss the fj now you see in the expression for scattering amplitude i wrote earlier <coughs> if you remember the scattering amplitude in case of neutron it was sum over j b j it will be per i q dot r j this becomes g when i come to a crystal lattice otherwise q remains q because i will also discuss with you when q is not equal to g in case of liquid and amorphous system but that's later <coughs> excuse me so this q is g and now what i have in case of scattering amplitude for x rays is fj e to the power i q or g dot rj you see they are same so the selection rule for a crystal analyte is for neutrons so for neutron scattering length was equal to which is f k q prime for a crystal lattice it comes down to exactly same as x rays and in case of x rays i have scattering amplitude is equal to so except for these two terms bj and fj they are identical so bj i know which is the coherent scattering length we know we wrote as b average and what is fj fj is the fourier transform of a charge cloud at the side j fourier transform of this but this is an important difference between x rays and neutrons if you do this fourier transform actually uh, in kittel it is shown for a spherical charge cloud you can write n r equal to some constant when r is less than a radius i can assume a constant charge cloud and then you can do this 
d3 r will be r square d theta dr d phi and q dot r is q r cos theta you can try this integral but this is not my aim to evaluate this integral over here but the fact is it's an extended charge cloud because it is an extended charge cloud so the fourier transform will look somewhat like this so if i draw them draw it the fourier transform will fall in space but if you think in terms of the scattering length average scattering length per neutron it does not have any angle dependence so again i am writing q here it's constant and it's so obvious because your scattering potential for neutrons is a delta function and if you take a delta function its fourier transform is constant all over q a delta function in real space will give a constant value in all over q whereas in case of x rays because it is an extended charge cloud by extended i mean the extension is of the order of the wavelength of x rays you have this scattering amplitude this form factor falling in q and larger your atom the faster it will fall that means the form factor for uranium because uranium has a much larger charge cloud will fall much faster than the charge cloud for an aluminum where well, aluminum has a much smaller charge cloud so this charge cloud this form factor falls depending on the atom and its size of charge cloud whereas in case of neutron the form factor's equivalent is b which is a coherent scattering length it does not have any angular dependence so this is a very interesting difference so in case of x rays you may not see large angle peaks so so this is one part your f part the other part is your the part which depends on the structure of the crystal xj plus h plus yj k plus zj this is the part which is a structure factor so the structure factor gives is given by the form factor multiplied by part which depends on the structure for example just as an example if you have a bcc crystals then a bcc crystal is one in which it's a cubic crystal you have atoms at the corner in the corner corner at the corner and then you have an atom at the body center at half 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 so that means if i consider the coordinates there is per unit cell there is one at 0 0 one is at half 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 so now you see for a bcc crystal the atoms are at 0 0 0 and half 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 in the unit cell and now you can write this s of hk equal to i consider only one atom so that fj will become f for all of them and the summation gives me 1 plus e to the power minus it was twice pi i xj h yj k zj l this is what i showed you and this is the st structure factor of hkl reflection for x rays this is the structure factor for neutrons as i again repeat there is a form factor there is a coherent scattering length this is the you can consider it as a fourier transform of a delta function which is constant at all q space whereas fj falls so with this 
you can see that for a BCC crystal, I can write down this expression as f into 1 plus e to the power minus i pi h plus k plus l. Uh, my apologies that I here I miss. Uh, A 2 pi term here. There should be because there is a one uh, as I wrote here. This is there will be a 2 pi term. So, second here when I wrote down this part x j h y there will be a 2 pi part because I mean when I define reciprocal lattice I missed one 2 pi point. So, here I am. I have to put a 2 pi term, 2 pi term. So with that, here is I, so 2 pi h plus k plus l because xj, yj, zj, you have to put 0, 0, 0 in this summation. So that is 1 and when I put a half, 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 it comes pi i h plus k plus l. So now you see the structure factor is f into 1 plus h plus k plus l. Now you can see if h plus k plus l there are certain selection rules for them. This s h k l if h plus k plus l is even then it will give me 2f. You can see that from this expression. So this gives me the selection rule and if I use the values for neutron, it will be B, but this part remains same. So selection rule will remain same for X-rays and neutrons. So if we do extra diffraction, the position of the peaks for let us say a BCC crystal will remain same as that. What you get in case of neutrons. So neutrons and X-rays, the selection rules remain the same, but the form factors are different and that's why your high angle peaks may be less intense because this F is multiplying this factor. So your structure factor has a pre-factor F which is falling in Q space or falling in theta, but B does not fall in theta. So apart from that, this, this part of the expression remains the same 1 plus e to the power minus i pi h plus k plus l remains same and depending on the hkl values certain peaks will be allowed certain peaks will be forbidden like as i told you because e to the power minus i pi h plus k plus l is in the way cos pi h plus k plus l plus i sin pi h plus k plus l whenever cos term is 1 you will have this uh, SHKL present when it is minus 1 then it will not be present that particular reflection will not be present. So you get the selection rules which are same for X-ray than neutron form facts are different. So this way I have established an equivalence between neutron diffraction and the way many of you have learned X-ray diffraction they are identical. I started from slightly different points and reached at the same place. Uh, next, I need to discuss the thermal effect before I go forward because uh, so far I have considered a lattice which is at 0 degree Kelvin. There are no fluctuations or no thermal effects in this lattice. I will introduce the thermal effect and then I will go ahead. Thank you.